In this video, I want to provide a brief overview of natural selection. I want to start by talking about selective breeding because I think you already have an understanding of how this works. Humans have been selectively breeding plants and animals for thousands of years to produce plants and animals that do what we want them to do. The basic process is you find a particular trait that you like and you want to keep and make more common. Identify the parent organisms, whether it's two animals or two plants, that have that good version of the trait. Breed them together and then keep the offspring that shows the improved trait and breed those offspring to increase the frequency of the trait or how often it shows up in the population. We've done that to give us bigger chickens and turkeys for the dinner table, to produce juicier tomatoes and sweeter apples, and to make all the many sizes of dogs that we have that you can find in the world, from very small to very large. So that's selective breeding. Well, the environment does a selective breeding, but we call that natural selection. And what the environment is like will select for certain traits in the organisms. You know already that there are limited resources in an ecosystem. There's only so much food. There's only so much space. And habitats do change, either because of a disruption, um, a forest fire, or long-term climate change. And so as things change or as resources get limited, certain organisms are going to do better. They're going to be favored. They'll be more likely to survive. We usually call that fitness. So they are more fit for the environment, and so they are the ones who will survive, they will be the ones who will reproduce, and so their offspring, if they carry that same trait, will better fit the environment. And that whole process is what we call natural selection. So our little example down here of the snowshoe hare, we have a type of rabbit that can has the trait of changing its fur color as temperatures change so that it better blends into a wintry landscape with white fur in the wintertime, but then is a brown rabbit that matches better with the greenery in the warmer weather. And this trait allowed this particular population of individuals to survive, to not be eaten by predators because they are better camouflaged, and that established that particular population or that trait in those animals. Now, in order for natural selection to work, it depends on genetic variability. And genetic variations or differences in DNA that lead to slight differences in a, the way a particular trait is expressed can be seen in any population of organisms. So we have all these different snail shells over here, and you can see that there's just a variety of colors. They're all the same size and the same shape. They're the same species of snail, but they just have different coloration in their shells. You're familiar with the many different kinds of skin tones that we have in the human population. I'm not even sure what they've decided the maximum number of that is, but there are a lot of different variations on what your skin tone looks like. And of course, there's just colors that are found in different flowers. Even though the flower is the same, the color of the petals would be different. Different environmental conditions, then, may favor one variation over another. Going back to the snail shells, you know, snails that live in an environment that is more light-colored, the lighter colored shells are probably the ones that would be doing better. They would be less likely to be eaten. But a snail that's living in a darker environment, well, a darker colored shell would be more favorable. A real-life example of these genetic variations and how that can affect survivability was seen with the peppered moth. So here's a picture of the peppered moth in its two variations, the two color variations of a light colored kind of a speckled gray version and then a dark darker gray or almost black version. These are forest dwelling moths that live in England and before the Industrial Revolution, before we had a lot of air pollution and soot uh, being a uh, bit out into the air by the factories, most of the moths were light colored. So if scientists or naturalists were collecting moths, most of the ones that they found were light colored. There were a few dark, but the majority of the population, well over 80%, were the light colored moth because that speckled appearance of the wings matches the trees that the moths would sit on and that allowed them to be camouflaged so they'd be less likely to be eaten by a bird.
Well, during the Industrial Revolution, where we had factories producing lots of pollution and lots of soot-laden air, the trees actually became darker in color. They became dirty because of the pollution collecting on the bark. And so the dark-colored moss then become more successful. They were the ones that could hide on these darker trees and not be eaten for dinner. And so then they were able to breed and produce more offspring that were dark, and the population numbers of the dark moths increased. In more recent years, though, air pollution controls have greatly improved air quality, decreased the amount of um, darkness on the trees, and so the light-colored moth population has returned as being the dominant population. We see both color variations. They still exist in the population, but the environment is favoring the light ones over the dark ones. So this is an example of natural selection. The environment changed, and so the trait that fit better in the environment was selected for. More of that particular trait or individuals with that trait survived, and it pushed the whole population more to one side. Sometimes you will hear this peppered moth example being held up as an example of evolution. And it is an example of microevolution. It is changing within a species so that one trait is much more abundant, much more frequent than another. And perhaps ultimately you could get to a point where there were no more light colored moths left if the pollution stayed around and there just was nowhere for them to be successfully camouflaged. But it is not an example of the macroevolution that would turn one species into something entirely new. And I think using the word evolution really is kind of a wishy-washy use of it. I think it's more important to talk about this as natural selection because that is what it is. It's not an example of species changing, but it is an example of change within a species. There are basically three ways that natural selection works on populations. First of all, you have a diversifying or disruptive selection that separates a population into two versions of a trait. And you see that with the moths. You have a light and you have a dark, but there really wasn't an in-between. Because in the environment, there would be a situation where the light moth could be safe on light-colored tree bark, and the dark moth would be safe, perhaps on a shadow of the light-colored, but one that was in between couldn't find a place to be camouflaged from predators anywhere, and that particular individual with that trait would just be eaten and we'd stop seeing it in the population. So diversifying, you get two extremes of a particular trait. Stabilizing selection is when the environment selects for one version of the trait and the other versions are gradually eliminated. <clears throat> so we also saw that with the moths when we had more frequently seen the dark moths during the time of high pollution and naturally more light moths now when the lighter tree bark was more common for the environment. And then finally we have directional selection which selects for one side of a continuum with traits. This is usually seen with something like size. The little picture over here is showing you, you know, perhaps how a giraffe developed its long neck so that a particular um, body structure is more favorable and so that is the one that survives more often and so instead of having all different sizes we are seeing a particular species going to one particular size. There are three key facts about natural selection that I want to make sure you understand. First of all, natural selection is determined by the environment. However the environment is, however those factors are limiting and um, you know, the abiotic and biotic factors in the environment are going to determine which traits are going to help an organism survive. And if the organism survives and reproduces and those traits get passed on to more offspring, then those are the traits that are going to show up in the population. You'll have traits that are neutral, and they basically just carried along, get carried along. They are ignored. They aren't selected for. They aren't selected against. Within the human population, we have a trait of having six fingers and six toes. It's still there in the population. It's not really selected for or selected against. It just kind of shows up every so often. Since the usefulness of traits is dependent on environmental factors, traits that are helpful in one environment might actually be useless or even harmful in another. So it's very dependent on the environment. Natural selection is driven by what's going on in the ecosystem, what's going on in the world around that organism. Another key fact about natural selection is it acts on existing genetic variation. You must have variations already present in a population. 
Natural selection does not create new traits to fit a situation. No, it just responds to traits that are already there. This genetic variation comes from random mutations in the DNA. Again, organisms do not mutate on purpose. They don't decide to change. But the random changes in DNA create mutations that may then come result in a new trait. And in order for this trait to be useful, of course, it must be able to pass from your parent to, to an offspring. So this little chart on the right kind of shows <clears throat> that we have three variations possible that are coming in this population because of genetic changes, because of DNA changes. One of them is unfavorable, so it's going to be selected against. Those individuals are not going to survive. The ones that did survive will go on to reproduce, and so we have a new generation <clears throat> and some new traits. And again, some of those traits are not so favorable. They will not survive in that environment. And so we eventually will have a population that's going to look very different than the parent population because the environment has pushed for a particular trait. This is happening over many generations. If we look here, we've got, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six different generations shown. This is not something that happens to an individual, but it's what's getting passed on to the next generation as organisms reproduce, and then that next generation will be showing how the, the frequency of that trait has changed. Now, as I kind of hinted before, sometimes natural selection and evolution kind of get mixed up. Natural selection is understood as the mechanism of evolution, how it is possible that species, new species can develop. The idea is, is that over generations, populations become better adapted to their environment and potentially could change enough to create a new species. And remember the definition I like of species is that it's not able to interbreed. The organism is completely distinct. And then any non-adapted population would go extinct, would disappear. Natural selection, of course, as I've said before, assumes that genetic variation already exists in the living organisms, and therefore natural selection really does not address how life originated. And in reality, we still have lots of unknowns about how life developed and adapted on Earth. There are a lot of things that are more just thought experiments. We don't have good evidence from um, the natural world or you know, a scientific experiment. We just kind of think about how it perhaps could happen. But natural selection on a microevolution level, on within a species, changing within that species, adaptation over generation of a species, changing to fit the environment more in a better way, is very clearly evidence-based. There are lots of examples in looking in both plant and animal and bacteria and virus, all of the populations of living organisms. And it is a very important process in the adaptation of species to fill the earth with life.